Hello, everyone. This is the very first episode of a new series that I'm beginning, and I'm calling it for short, Jesus Archaeology. And as I explained in the introduction, the idea is not to find Jesus or to prove Jesus or to do archaeology for any kind of uh, apologetic reasons, but it's asking the question, given the textual evidence that we have regarding Jesus of Nazareth, particularly the material in the New Testament writings and our four Gospels, what about the material evidence that's come from the Holy Land, from the land where Jesus lived, Judea, Samaria, and the Galilee during the Roman period? And does it shed light or provide further context for understanding many of the texts that we read? I'm convinced that the answer is a big yes, a resounding yes, and that the insights of archaeology are crucial. Now, today I'm beginning, number one, talking about 10 tombs from the Herodian period, as we call it, from the time of Jesus. The Herodian period dates from Herod's reign, about 40 BCE, all the way down to 70 CE when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So even though Herod died in 4 BC or 3 BC or 2 BC, depending on the reckoning and all the records, that's still controversial. Basically, the turn of the century as we count it now. We still refer to that whole period as the Herodian period because of Herod's temple, mainly, and all of the rebuilding that Herod did in Jerusalem during that time. It's very much Herodian. But a better historical designation would be late Second Temple Judaism, so the period that I study as a scholar from about 100 years before the time of Jesus on up to about 100 years after, so essentially a couple of hundred years. So I would define the late Second Temple period basically as from the Maccabees through the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. And of course, there are events after that. It doesn't end on a dime, as we say. So I'm going to go ahead and share this screen. So here's a lot of alliteration. Let's see if I can read it. The tales tombs tell, 10 Jerusalem tombs in the time of Jesus. I hope you enjoyed that alliteration. I want to look at ossuaries, inscriptions, skeletons, and DNA. And I do have some new things to present in this video that I've never presented publicly before. So here's a picture of an ossuary. When we talk about inscriptions, skeletons, and DNA, we're essentially talking about this period from the reign of Herod on down to the destruction of Jerusalem in which ossuary burial in cave tombs was so very common in Jerusalem, a little bit in the Galilee as well. But all 10 of these tombs, as I say here, are Jerusalem tombs. Okay, so let's dive in and look at these 10 tombs and hear the tales that they tell. Let me start with these two books. This book, uh, I co-wrote it with the filmmaker Simka Jacobovici. You might know him from his very popular History Channel series, The Naked Archaeologist. You can get all of his films still on YouTube. And he did a film about this Jesus discovery called The Resurrection Tomb. So even though in the Jesus dynasty, I had covered very thoroughly the first Talpiot tomb discovered in 1980 that we call the Jesus family tomb, or sometimes the garden tomb in between a condominium development, this one is different. It's less than 200 feet away from the Jesus family tomb, but it is under a condominium building. And we were able to explore it remotely, as I'm going to show you. And that's what this book is about. But we used the occasion of the book to update all sorts of related archaeology in terms of looking at the historical Jesus. So I want to start with that. Now, this book, as you can see by Kathy Reichs, it's called Crossbones. Notice, is a novel, so it's fiction. Kathy writes 
forensic anthropology thrillers and murder mysteries where bones and DNA and bodies and tombs always solve the case. She is the creator of the Fox television drama Bones. She traces the career of her fictional character, Tempe Brennan, who actually is teaching at the University of North Carolina in the novel. And that's where Kathy and I taught for years together as fellow colleagues on the faculty. She was in anthropology, I was in religious studies. Now it's a novel, so she can do anything that she wants in the novel, but she bases the story on our work on the Jesus family Taupio tomb. And so I wanted to mention it. It's a real thrill to read. I've got a fictional character in it. I think my name is Jake Drum, as I recall. And remember, if you're writing fiction, it can come out any way you want. So it has all kinds of intrigue with the Vatican involved and lost manuscripts and tombs and bones and DNA and everything else. Now, these two books are reference books. They're thick. They're expensive. I don't recommend you run out and buy them unless you're really interested in this, but they both have to do with what's called the necropolis of ancient Jerusalem. A necropolis, of course, is a city of the dead. So it's the cemetery that rings Jerusalem on the north, the east, and the south. There's a few scattered tombs on the west, but it's mainly a kind of a crescent around the ancient old city of Jerusalem in the late second temple period. So there are many, many tombs that have been uncovered. This first volume has all the inscriptions of Jerusalem during this period, 704 inscriptions, and about 600 to 650 are from ossuaries. Most of the inscriptions we have from this period are names written on ossuaries and occasionally a couple of epitaphs or other kinds of phrases. And this volume by Cloner and Zisu the Necropolis of Jerusalem in the Second Temple Period, the very title I'm using here, gives all of the tombs. It covers over 900 tombs. When they were found, how they were found, was it building, was it accidental? Tombs are sometimes robbed, and it gives you the GPS coordinates, what was found in the tomb, how many ossuaries, and all sorts of information. Also includes diagrams of all the tombs, and pictures of many of the ossuaries. Here's a summary of the data. 900 cave tombs that we're looking at, more than 2,000 ossuaries, and some think there are as many as 3,000 because many have disappeared. We're talking about a 75 to 100 year period in which people were coming to Jerusalem and exploring. And, and in the 19th and early 20th century, people would even sell ossuaries and they got distributed all over the place. And we're trying to get hold of all of them so that we have a record of the period. The main catalog is Rahmani right here and 20% of those have inscriptions. That catalog only goes up to 1989, and it has almost 900 ossuaries, and 227 are inscribed. So those are owned by the state of Israel. But in addition to those, you can see there's another thousand that we know about, and some are at other institutions in Jerusalem, some are in the United States, some are in Europe, private collector's hands, and so forth. I'm going to tell you about one of those that I was given by a private collector that's going to get returned to Israel to be part of their collection. So with 20% inscribed, we actually have a little higher percentage if you take all that we know about uh, with our 600 or so inscriptions. You're going to find them in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and a few in Latin. All of them are from cave burials family burials. They're not individual inscriptions. There's not much evidence in ancient Jerusalem for field burials or dug graves in the period. And the date of the necropolis is first century BCE up to 70 AD when normal Jewish burial activity was curtailed. Here's a wonderful map that comes from Cloner and Zisu's book, and it shows you these dots are actual tombs. So here are your 900 tombs, and you can get a shotgun effect of the distribution. You see, here's the old city, 
and you've got all of these on the north and then the east this is primarily the mount of olives and the mount of offense as it's called to the south and then a lot to the south so all of this has been rebuilt in the last 75 years or so and there are apartments and roads and shopping centers and all kinds of modern buildings going up and as they go up more and more tombs get uncovered it's not uncommon for someone to have a tomb in the basement of the building that they live in and those tombs are examined by the israel antiquities authority and they're cataloged now in this catalog and we have a pretty good handle on how many there are but new tombs still turn up all the time unfortunately sometimes from thieves that rob tombs there are tombs right here in the Hinnom Valley that are still unopened from the past 2,000 years. So that's pretty incredible. And it's absolutely forbidden to break into those tombs, but occasionally it happens. And one of the tombs I'm going to talk about in my 10 was a recently robbed tomb in the year 2000. Keynote question. Here's what I want to address. Is there a likelihood that the tomb of any identifiable person or family from the period would be discovered with all of this building activity and all of these hundreds of tombs and hundreds of ossuaries coming to light? The answer, I think, is yes, which makes it very interesting. A lot of the building has taken place since 1967, after the Six-Day War, when there was archeology span beginning again around the old city. The fortunate aspect of that is that the Israel Antiquities Authority examines the tombs. So no longer do we have people just finding a tomb and robbing it and going and selling the ossuaries on the black market. But the building has also disturbed many of the tombs and there's a proper way to handle that when it happens, Orthodox Jews in charge of Jewish burial are brought in and they go into the tomb and they take the human remains, the bones, and rebury them in a common area and give them a decent reburial. And then the tomb itself and the ossuaries can be handled as archaeological relics and be studied, which they are. Okay, so here's the countdown. We're going to do one up to ten. Number one is an ossuary that I was given a few years ago by a private collector, and he decided to turn it over to an academic who works on this material, which I do. And what makes it really appealing and interesting are the names. Here you can see the inscription. It's very clear Hebrew, not Aramaic. And we know that by the word ben here, son, rather than bar. And what it says is, Yehonatan ben Yeshua. So, Jonathan, son of Yeshua. Now, nobody thinks uh, this is Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, and he had a kid named Jonathan. There's no reason to particularly think that. I guess it's possible. Now, you're going to hear from people because of the tomb I'm going to show you in a few minutes with another Yeshua in it, that it's a very common name. Well, it's not a very common name. It's 4.3% of males were named Yeshua. And you can do name frequency stats on all of these names. And I think they're pretty accurate and talk about what percentage of males were named Yeshua. So it's about 4.3, 4.5%, somewhere in that range. Here's the thing, though, and the reason I put this in here, number one, as my first example, is unprovenance. We don't know anything about it. It ends up in New York for sale, and it was bought by an individual collector who contacted me a few years ago and asked if I wanted it because he'd read about all the work that I was doing on tombs and ossuaries, and I really appreciated that because it needs to be included in the collection. There are 19 times so far in all of the ossuaries where the name Yeshua appears, but that doesn't add up to 19 tombs. So you might have two examples of Yeshua in a single tomb, but it would be the same Yeshua, one Yeshua. Uh, for example, the Talpiot Garden Tomb, you have a Yeshua son of Joseph, and also 
you have a Jude son of Yeshua. It's the same guy, we think. So what do you do with these unprovidence ossuaries? Well, we can record the names. We can study them. We can describe them. I'm going to publish this one. And then if the state of Israel wants to add it to their collection, we'll ship it over to them. Otherwise, I'll take care of it. However, there's one new possibility that I'm going to talk about, particularly toward the end of our list of 10, and that is the possibility of extracting DNA. You look in this ossuary, it looks very clean, but body fluids and pieces of bone and debris do sink into the limestone, and we have now shown that that can also be tested for DNA. So even if you have an empty ossuary, it doesn't mean you can't get some scientific data. Okay, a little bit very quickly about Jewish burial in the period. Here you have a wonderful painting, very moving painting. It's in the Myers Park Methodist Church here in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you ever come to North Carolina, you can visit the church and see it. It's on the stairway going up the stairs in the main building. And I assume this is Mary Magdalene, or maybe the sister or family member of Jesus, grieving over the corpse. So what you first do is you wash the corpse, and you anoint it with oil and prepare it for burial. And that involves a burial shroud and a funerary procession, which we reenacted here for a burial to show. This was for a film that I was involved in. And in the tomb, the body is laid out for about a year, and then the bones are collected and put into one of these ossuaries. And as we saw in about 20% of the cases, or a bit more, you might scratch the name of the deceased on the side of the tomb and even have something more son of, daughter of, sister of, even sometimes where the person is from. Here's what the bones look like once they've been put into an ossuary. This is a single person. It's the width of a skull, the length of the femur bone. So a child's ossuary is smaller, uh, but this is an adult in this case. And when a tomb is found, the bones are taken out by Orthodox Jews, reverently reburial with the burial ceremony, rest in peace, and then the ossuary can be taken out of the tomb and studied. This is what a tomb looks like. This is not any specific tomb. You got the oil lamp here. You know, grave goods are not found really in a Jewish tomb. You might find some oil lamps. Maybe a coin was left behind when somebody was buried over the years. But this is what it looks like. This one's a little taller than they normally are if you had this person stand up. Uh, normally, the ceiling would be something like right here you'd have to kind of stoop down to go into this tomb. Typically, a meter and a half would be the limit of the height. Here are ossuaries that are holding former people that have died. You lay the body out on a slab, and once it has decomposed, you can gather it together and put it in the ossuary. So that covers the practice of the secondary burial that went on in the Herodian period. So let's go to our second ossuary. I asked the question, do you ever find someone who's known or mentioned in texts? Well, what about finding one of the most well-known people mentioned in the New Testament? This is the high priest, Joseph Caiaphas, he's called. This is the one who presides over the crucifixion of Jesus at the trial. And he's mentioned by name in our historical sources certainly in the Gospels, but also in books like the historian Josephus. So we know who he is. We know something about his family. He's the son-in-law of the high priest Annas. And Annas had six of his sons serve as high priest, and he put in his son-in-law, and Caiaphas happened to be the high priest when Jesus was brought up for trial and taken to Pontius Pilate for crucifixion. So in November of 1990, in the Peace Forest, which is just south of the old city, in the Valley of Hinnom, was found this tomb. And here is one of the kokim, or the slots. Let me go back and show you. These slots that go in 
are called cocaim. This is called an arcosolium. So in one of the slots you're looking here, you had a couple of ossuaries. And this particular ossuary, so beautiful, belongs to Yosef Kaffa. And here you can see uh, an indication maybe of the wealth, even though the tomb itself can be kind of modest. But there's an inscription here. You can't see it very well in this particular slide unless you zoom in. But here's what it looks like. Yosef Bar Kaffa, uh, basically Joseph, son of Caiaphas. That's an amazing find. It's in the Israel Museum right now. And as far as I know, DNA has not been done from the residue that might be in that ossuary, but that's a possibility for the future. So yes, sometimes you do find the tomb and the ossuary of a very famous person. This tomb is interesting on many other grounds that I'm not going to cover today. But one thing I'll mention is in the mouth of one of the deceased, a family member, not Joseph Caiaphas himself, but a family member was a Greek coin to pay the ferryman in the world of the dead. Isn't that interesting? You'd put the coin on the tongue of the deceased, a Greek practice. So that shows you that the Jewish high priests in the time of Jesus were well aware of a very Roman or Hellenistic burial practice, even though they were obviously Jews of the priestly lineage. Now, number three, Beth Fage. On the Mount of Olives, at this little town of Beth Fage, here's the old city, Kidron Valley, Garden of Gethsemane, and so forth. If you go over the summit and down the hill on the way to Bethany, so Jesus would have passed this many times. If you remember in the Gospels, the last week of his life, he's staying at Bethany with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And every morning he would get up and walk past Bethphage and down and down the Mount of Olives on a pathway. This uh, little uh, stop today, Dominus Flavit, is on the path. And he would go then up into the temple area for the day. If you read the Gospel of Mark, uh, it gives the day-by-day -day itinerary. Now, the first day that he does this, he tells the disciples go into the village ahead as they're coming up. And that's the village of Bethphage. It means the house of unripe figs, literally. And you'll see a donkey and uh, bring it uh, to me. And that donkey's from Bethphage. But that's not why I'm mentioning it. Bethphage has a tomb. And this is my third tomb. And it definitely tells us some tales. Let's take a look. First, I've got to tell you that I think there's good evidence that Jesus was crucified on the Mount of Olives. So let me explain some things. There are two other proposals for Jesus' crucifixion, and I have a YouTube video on this about finding Golgotha. You can look it up. It wasn't long ago that I made it. So the Church Holy Sepulcher, Roman Catholic, and Gordon's Calvary in the north of the city. I won't go into details, but I think this might be the site. And if this is the crucifixion site, and I give you all the arguments for that, but I'm not going to repeat them in this video because I want to get to the tomb. But we do have a record in the Gospel of John about Jesus being put in a tomb near the site of crucifixion. You know, usually the Gospel of John is thought as the latest and least reliable historically, but it turns out the last chapters of John, what we call the passion narrative about the arrest and death and burial and empty tomb of Jesus. John has a lot of material. He knows about two trials with the high priest, Annas, and then Caiaphas as well. He knows details about the Pontius Pilate trial. And I've also done YouTube videos on that about Pilate's judgment seat that I think has been discovered. That's all because of the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John is very helpful on this point. Mark doesn't know this. And remember, Matthew and Luke just follow Mark. All Mark knows is that Jesus was buried in a tomb, but he doesn't emphasize exactly where it was. It's obviously within walking distance. But in the Gospel of John, it says near the place of crucifixion 
was a new tomb unfinished that no one had ever used. So it's an empty tomb that belongs to somebody nearby, and we're on the Mount of Olives here, but they put the body there as an emergency burial. So there are two burials of Jesus. There's the first burial that's temporary because Passover is coming at sundown. This is the way I put it together. It makes sense. And the burial party, which is Joseph of Arimathea and his associate Nicodemus, according to the Gospel of John, they're going to come right after the Sabbath is over. Because when the Passover falls in the Sabbath day, you don't bring a body home because that would ritually defile the whole household in terms of the Passover and going up to the temple and so forth. So what do you do with the dead body hours before the Passover festival and over the Sabbath day of that weekend? You have to put it somewhere. So this emergency burial is not the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I know Matthew says that, but he doesn't know this. He just assumes if Joseph's doing it, it must be his tomb. But John knows, he has a source, he knows more about the details. And he says, no, it just happened to be nearby. And because of the Sabbath and the festival drawing near, they put him there. It's very clear. Look it up in the Gospel of John. Secondly, when Mary Magdalene comes in the Gospel of John, John chapter 20, just the first 10 verses, you've got, I think, a account of how that tomb was found empty. You know, recently, my friend Mark Goodacre has done some very good work on the use of this term, empty tomb. And he's pointed out that if Jesus was put in a family tomb, like of Joseph of Arimathea, the tomb wouldn't be empty. And actually, the accounts don't say that it's empty. They say that the place where they laid Jesus was empty. But it makes even more sense with this idea because it's an unfinished tomb, an emergency burial that happens to be near the place of crucifixion, okay? So if I go back to my map, if Jesus is crucified right at the summit of the Mount of Olives, like I have in my painting, and that painting, by the way, I had commissioned for the Jesus dynasty. And if you have a hardcover version, it's produced in color inside the front hardcover, which is just very beautiful. So if Jesus is crucified here, nearby, and this is very close, is this unused tomb, if this is it, tomb number three. And it makes sense. So what happens in the Gospel of John? John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, is Mary Magdalene comes alone to the tomb, not with a burial party. Doesn't say anything about she wants to anoint the body for burial. You get the idea that she's coming there mainly to mourn and witness them taking the body away. But they've already been there. Most likely the burial party, Joseph of Arimathea and his colleagues, would have gone Saturday night. Why? Because it's an emergency burial and the corpse is beginning to decay. Jewish burials are normally done 24 to 48 hours after, and this is now getting into the third day. And they've got to get that body Saturday night and rebury it. And where would they rebury it? I assume on the estate of Joseph of Arimathea, that he does provide his own tomb, but it's not this unfinished first tomb. You see how that makes sense? Now, then what do you read? What does Mary Magdalene say? She says, they've taken the Lord away, and I don't know where they've taken him. You see? Because she's not in charge of the burial. So she runs to Bethany, and she gets Peter and the beloved disciple. I think that's James, the brother of Jesus. I don't think it's the fisherman, James, the son of Zebedee. That's a later idea that develops in the second and third century. Uh, but it doesn't make any sense. The beloved disciple is the one to whom Jesus hands over the care of his own mother. That would be his brother, James, next in line of the family. It's a Jewish thing. It's very clear. So she runs and gets James and Peter. They race to the tomb. I've walked this many times, kind of tracing the route, if this is the tomb. And uh, it's empty. They want to verify it. 
And it says that they looked and remember Peter goes in. It, it sounds kind of like it has some steps maybe. And he looks in and James stays outside because he's a priest and he doesn't want to get defiled by going into a tomb. So here's what the tomb looks like that I'm talking about. It's at Beth Fage behind the church. It's private property, not open to the public. It's got a big fence around it, but I've studied it extensively. Here I am standing in the entrance. Here's looking out. You can see the steps going down and it has a rolling stone, which is rare. And that's mentioned in the New Testament. And if you go inside the tomb, looking back, you see there the stone. You can see how James could have peeked in from here and seen that the body, which would have been laid here, is not gone. And Peter would have rambunctiously, like he always did, rushed in the tomb and checked it out. And according to the Gospel of John, there were grave clothes folded up. There was a head cover for the face and a shroud for the body wrapped up, and it was just to drape the body so that it would be covered and not naked before the permanent burial. Now, why do I think this is the tomb? Well, it's in the right place for one thing, but over here you have early Christian graffiti on this wall, which is very amazing. Take a look. Here's a close-up of some of the inscriptions on that wall. You've got the tree of life, which symbolizes everlasting life. You've got the eternity sign, which symbolizes resurrection and eternity. You've got various other kinds of scratching, Greek letters, as well as Hebrew letters down here. Here's a diagram of all the scratchings on that tomb. We think all of these are ancient. We're not sure what the meaning of all of these might be, but here's a Hebrew, here's a Greek. It doesn't say anything. It's probably Greek letters, each letter standing for a word. We've tried to kind of figure out what it might mean, but it's really amazing. So this tomb could very possibly be a tomb related to the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, I know you've got to go with the whole chain of evidence, but number three, I think, is worth examining, and we now need to study it even more, and we can do that. There's still a possibility of studying it more. Number four, Tomb of the Shroud, Hinnom Valley. So this is just south of Jerusalem. So what happened was it was in the year 2000, and we had been digging in Suba, so I'm with Shimon Gibson, my archaeological friend and colleague, and we had a license to dig at Suba, which is a the town of John the Baptist near Ein Kerem, west of Jerusalem. And we dig Sunday through Friday, and on Friday we take off. So it was Friday afternoon, and we're going into Jerusalem for pizza and to relax and enjoy the Sabbath. And so Shimon says, would you like to hike the Hinnom Valley? It was still daylight. And look at some of the tombs that are there that have not been opened yet. And just get an idea of how Jewish burial is. And when you pass one of the tombs, you don't see this, of course. This is a cutaway. You see the facade of the entrance of the tomb that has now been filled over the centuries with soil. But when we got up the hill, as we passed this tomb, we saw dirt, fresh dirt kicked out, uh, bones scattered everywhere, and broken ossuaries everywhere. And we knew immediately this tomb had been robbed probably the night before. We were very emotional, very excited about the idea of a first century tomb being open like this. I think we had six of my students with me and Shimon Gibson and I and Shimon went into the tomb and a couple of students, I kind of stood watch outside here for a while. Later, I went in and the tomb has several layers. And when he got down to this lower level where the family burials are, all of these ossuaries were broken. But in this niche were the fairly well-preserved skeletal remains and burial shroud of a deceased male. Amazing. Now, you don't find burial shrouds in ancient Jewish tombs. None of those 900 tombs that have been discovered so far have ever had burial shrouds in them because Jerusalem is in the mountains. It's rainy in the winter. 
It's 2,400 feet above sea level. Cloth does not survive. But this particular niche was blocked up right here with a blocking stone so that it was sealed and water did not get to it. And the burial shroud was deteriorated, but preserved enough to see. It looked like burnt newspaper. It was very delicate. And we began to collect it as well as the bones, which we turned over for reburial to the Orthodox Jews. But the burial shroud we kept, and we also determined from some of the skeletal remains that this person had leprosy. And I mean real leprosy, the bacteriological leprosy, Hansen's disease. And this is the first example ever discovered from this period of someone with Hansen's disease. Because a lot of Bible scholars had thought, well, when it mentions leprosy, like Simon the leper in the Gospels, it's probably like a really bad skin disease. No, we think it was real leprosy that deteriorates from the inside out and destroys all of your limbs and a lot of your face and so forth. It's a horrible disease. So this person was a leper. Now, we're able to study the burial shroud. It's two pieces. It has a headpiece and a piece for the body. And we had it carbon dated at the same lab in Arizona that had dated the Shroud of Turin, remember, that came out Middle Ages. And guess what? Our shroud came out first century. No doubt about it. When people heard that, they were just astounded. I, I think eventually it will be on display. It's still being studied. But it was one of the great discoveries. Accidental. Amazing. So that is number four. Now, a little more about it. Here I am crawling into it. Looks like I'm crawling out, but I'm actually going in. And I've got my coach beautiful leather jacket on. And when my wife saw this picture, she said, you went in that tomb with that jacket. And remember the other tomb, the Beth Fage tomb? I've got the same jacket on. And I still have this jacket today. It's much more worn now because it's 23 years old. But uh, anyway, it's a beautiful jacket. So you crawl down into the tomb and there's one level, then you go to another level and then you drop down into the chamber. Now, we were able to reassemble the ossuaries and they're now in the Israel State Collection, but only two had names left. We think a lot of the others had names. See these pieces here, they were missing. And I mean, we checked the tomb, we checked outside the tomb, what the thieves want, I said earlier, you don't get grave goods in a Jewish tomb. You know what they want? They want the names inscribed. It's illegal, but they can take these into Jerusalem, go to a shady antiquities dealer that's willing to do this, who keeps them in the back room. And once some naive Christian tourists come by, they say, by the way, for you and only you, I've got some special things to show you. You can't tell anybody, but if you would like this, I have a piece of an ossuary from the first century that has Maria written on it, Mary, the name of Jesus' mother. Not saying it's Jesus' mother, but wouldn't you like to have this on your mantle at home, an authentic piece of an ossuary with the first century name, preferably of somebody mentioned in the New Testament? Then you're going to get a lot of money for it, probably $500 to $1,000. So that's what the thieves are after. In the year 2000, it's too dangerous for thieves to try to take out an ossuary, even at night, to carry that down the valley and down the road. You would maybe be spotted by a lot of people, and you would get arrested, and the penalties are pretty severe. So we were able to uh, restore these ossuaries. Now, these can also be studied. You can see right here. Look at this one. See this right here? See how that is all clean? This is where the body remains came up and it leaves a line. And this is material, organic material from the body, from the corpse that is soaked into the limestone. And we now believe, nobody's done this but us, that we can take scrapings of this material and get really good DNA results. If we do this, it's going to revolutionize things because we can begin to do family profiles. But guess what? We were able from bone fragments that were left behind because they're all over the inside of the tomb to do testing. And Orthodox Jews do allow the testing of human remains for identification purposes. 
And that's what we did in order to have more personal information about this family that had been so horribly violated by this robbery. And what did we find? We were able to do DNA for the first time, as far as I know, on a first century Herodian tomb. And if you want this, I'm going to put the link in the description and you can read this report yourself. This is the scientific report that was published. And we have DNA profiles as well as uh, evidence of the leprosy. You can read the abstract right here. So I'll put this in the description. It's a very exciting discovery. Okay, let's go on. Now we're going to go to two more tombs, the garden tomb and the patio tomb. This one has been excavated and exposed. That's the Jesus family tomb. And the patio tomb is the resurrection tomb, we call it. And it's under a condo building. So I'm going to show you a map where you won't get confused as to where these are. Here's the old city of Jerusalem. This is on a 19th century topographical map. And as you go south, this is the Hinnom Valley. By the way, that tomb of the shroud would be right here the tomb of the shroud. So this is further. You go up a hill and here are the two tombs. The road is right down below. Now, let me show you more. If I'm at Jerusalem looking toward Talpio, this is what it looks like. And here you have the peaks of two hills and the word Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea in English is Har Mountain Matayim, two peaks. And it could be that the area is called Arimathea. And I'll give you more evidence of that. So it's possible that Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus from the temporary burial on the Mount of Olives that you saw that tomb and took it to Talpiot. So here is a map by Claude Condor Claude Condor worked with Kitchener. They were royal engineers for the Palestine Exploration Fund. They were doing a survey of Western Palestine, as it was called. And here's their main map of the overview of Palestine. And if you go down here to Jerusalem, this is Jerusalem, there's the Dead Sea. Look over here at the blow up. Jerusalem, Aramathia. So they had identified from all of the records that they followed, they had all kinds of records of local people and inscriptions and ancient texts and so forth to identify these various places. And they were convinced that this was uh, Arimathea, the place of the two hills. Now, the Jesus family tomb looked like this when it was exposed and it was blown open. There would be a porch coming out from this area right here. You can see the sides of it, and that would be the court of mourning before you actually go into the tomb. It has a square plug uh, entrance, which is very common. The rolling stone is rare, and the plug was put in tightly, and it, it was very snug, as you're going to see in the drawing. Here's a meter stick, and you have this very unusual facade. I'm not going to discuss that today, but I will in the future. So this is East Talpio discovered in March 1980 when a construction crew was clearing the area for the foundations of these condominiums. Now today it's in a garden and the garden is a very pleasant place, but it's sealed up and this tomb is empty. There's nothing in this tomb. Uh, it was filled with soil and the blocking stone was never found and it wasn't blown up. It's very solid. I don't think it was blown up. It wasn't even blown out because your the explosion was up above the tomb from the ground level. It's been missing probably since the fourth century when there was an earthquake and this whole side of the hill collapsed, and then it filled back up with soil. That was a good thing in the sense that this tomb is very well preserved because it's full of soil. And that leads us to something very important that I'll tell you about. So here's the tomb. The blocking stone was put right here. It had 10 ossuaries. There are those shells where you put the body, the arcosolium. Here are the kokim or the shafts where you would put the ossuaries and their 10 all together. And then there were skeletal remains. In this drawing that Shimon 
Gibson did as a young man. He was called to uh, draw this tomb right after it was discovered. I think he came on Sunday and it was found on a Thursday. They removed the ossuaries, took them to the Israel Antiquities Authority storage in Jerusalem at the time. And he drew the tomb and there were three skulls, but there are other uh, bone remains probably that had been swept off the shelf, maybe by flooding or whatever. Or maybe the tomb was entered in the third century if there was an earthquake. Now, one of the ossuaries is inscribed, here it is, a picture of it, uh, Jesus, this is Yeshua, son of Bar, Yehoseph. Yehoseph, Jesus, son of Joseph. So you can see it written here in Hebrew letters. It looks like just graffiti, messy scratches, but when you begin to take away the scratches and look at the letters, it's actually quite elegant. Notice how you have this uh, for Yeshua, you have the iron sweeping on down. And then the pay at the end of Joseph has a nice tail on it. So Jesus, son of Joseph. And here are the other names. Six were inscribed. Yeshua bar Yehoseph. Yose, which is a nickname, very rare nickname. Not Yosi, which is very popular today. But Yose with a hay on the end. I think we only know two other ossuaries or inscriptions that use this name. But this is the name of Jesus' brother in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew doesn't put Yose, he puts Yosef. So the brothers are James the oldest, Yosef, but his nickname is Yose in the Gospel of Mark, and then Simon and Jude, remember? And then there's a Maria, a Mary, and a Mariamne, also known as Mara, which means the lady. Mariamne, not Mariam. The ne is very rare. You're going to see it sometimes in printed copies of Josephus. But if you look at the Greek, there's no letter N. It's just Mariam. So this is rare. And the only two examples we know of this form of the name in literature are references to Mary Magdalene. So one hypothesis is this would be Mary Magdalene. This could be Jesus' sister or maybe his mother. This would be his brother, and this would be him. But the surprise is he would have a Jude son of Jesus. These two are decorated. This is probably the mother. It's a wealthy person who has money. I don't think it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. I doubt if she would have a decorated ushery, but Mary Magdalene has money. She's supporting the movement, according to the Gospel of Luke, if you look at chapter 8 along with some other leading women. And remember, she takes charge of the burial along with Jesus' mother. So think about it. It's very interesting. Now, Matya is Matthew. We don't know uh, how he would come in as part of the family tomb, but we certainly know that it's a family name in the Jesus dynasty. Because if you look at the genealogy of Luke chapter 3, there are six other figures named Matad, it's a very priestly name, and we have record that James, the brother of Jesus, has priestly ancestry. And I've argued in a new book that isn't out yet called The Lost Mary, that Mary is also a priestly lineage as well as Davidic lineage. So you'll have to wait for the book to get the details on that unless you know French, because it's already out in French. So this shocked people who thought, well, this can't be the Jesus family tomb. This can't be where Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus because Jesus didn't have any kids and he wasn't married. Well, why would we assume that? So in the book, The Jesus Discovery, I have chapters on Mary Magdalene and also the idea of whether Jesus might have been married. I know if you survey New Testament scholars, some of my dear colleagues, I won't name names, but they're all going to say, well, there's no evidence he was married. We would know about that. But think about this, and I'm not going to give you the whole argument here, but, you know, a lot of the apostles were married. Name some of the wives. You can't name any wives. Now, Paul does say that Peter and the other apostles and brothers of the Lord travel around with their wives, but they're not named. So I don't think it's far-fetched that Jesus was married. He was 30 years old. Why not?
Okay, so as far as the Talpio tomb goes, let me make a couple of points because this is not a lecture just on the Talpio tomb. And I have that on my blog, in my book, The Jesus Dynasty, as well as quite a few YouTube videos. But here's an article I wrote. It's for Near Eastern Archaeology. I published it in 2005. And this article asked the question, how would you imagine a Jesus family tomb? Who would it have in it? Not the Talpio tomb, but in general. And I go through in this article and I give you uh, arguments that if you test the hypothesis that I suggest, and here's a picture of the Talpio Jesus family tomb, it does fit rather well. So I'm going to put the link to this also in the description. You can download this and print it out and have a copy free of charge. I like to give things away. Now, the other tomb, less than 200 feet away on the same ancient estate, and there's a third tomb that was completely blown up by the construction, but there are two that we can now study. We call it the Jonah tomb or the resurrection tomb. It's under the condo. This is the first floor of the condo. This goes to the street level. This is the basement storage area. So on the back, you can go into the basement storage area. Owners of condominiums have storage space provided for them. And the floor is right at ground level, as you can see. So the idea was we can go right over the tomb underground in the basement and open some holes large enough to get a robotic camera in. And that's what we did. One of the most amazing things I've ever done. And I thank Simka Jacobovici for making this possible because he was able to get the contract with the film company and Discovery Television finally broadcast this. And it's on YouTube. Be sure you watch the video on YouTube. This is an amazing discovery. So here's some pictures of our team. Uh, we had Orthodox Jews watching and approving of our process to make sure we don't do anything that would disturb the dead. Because remember, this tomb is intact. Here are some Orthodox Jews that didn't understand what we were doing. And this gentleman explained to them that we had permission from the chief rabbi to do this of their group. Here I am with uh, Rami Arav, and we're looking at our plans. This is a woman from the Israel Antiquities Authority. These are some people from General Electric that worked to create the camera work and so forth. Uh, so we had all kinds of people assembled. And here's what it looks like as you go down into the tomb, looking back at the camera. We turned the camera around and looked back, and you can see the opening just big enough for a robotic arm. And this is the first thing that we saw, an ossuary intact in a tomb with the blocking stone removed. Interesting. And we're not sure where this stone went because it wouldn't fit right here. This is a pillar that has to do with holding up the, the condo itself. So it kind of blocks our view. In this niche, we saw two ossuaries. This one's butted up against the other one. And this one has a drawing on it right here. You can barely see it. And I'll show you what we could see, but we couldn't see the whole thing like what's on this side. And this one right here that's butted up has an inscription, which we could see by angling the robotic arm down. Here's a better view of what we did. So we're coming into this hole right here. And there's that first one. And then we went and we saw these three. And then we saw these two. And this one has the image of a fish spitting up Jonah, as I'll show you in a minute. And this has an inscription about raising the dead. There were bones in some of the others and then other another ossuary here. So we're able to explore number six. Number five is the garden tomb or the Jesus family tomb. This is number six of my 10 that I want to cover today. And let's go and look at the image. Here you have your fish. You see the tail and the scales, the little flippers. And here's the gill mark, and here's the mouth, and what is this right here? We weren't sure at first, and what is this ball? Let's look at it more closely. Here is the gill mark, here is the mouth. These are Hebrew letters in perfect Herodian script. 
Yona, Yona, the V or the Vav, Yona, Jonah. And this would be representing Jonah rolling out of the mouth of the great fish. So let me explain something here. Jonah as an image and a story is in the Hebrew Bible. And in chapter three, it says he's in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. He's in a tomb. The fish is his tomb. And when he cries out to God, raise me up and save me, it's like he's raised from the dead. That image for resurrection was never used in any Jewish source that I know of, except the Gospels, the New Testament Gospels, where Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah. It's in the Q source, the earliest source that we have of Jesus' sayings that Matthew and Luke preserve. And they talk about the sign of Jonah. And Matthew even says that, you know, three days and three nights, resurrection. This becomes the most common symbol of resurrection of the dead and the most common symbol in Christian tombs in Rome in the catacombs later. You'd think it'd be the cross or the anchor or the fish. The most common image is actually, in fact, images of a fish or a dragon or a monster spitting out Jonah. So the artists had nothing to go on in terms of Christian art. Jews don't draw images of Jonah's fish. So if you read the text, go to Jonah 3 and read the text. Jonah gets rolled out on the shore. He's vomited up and he's all wrapped in seaweed. So I think that's what this is representing. Tumbling Jonah coming out of the mouth of the fish with his name right here. This blew us away. You got to watch the film because in the film, we're seeing this for the first time. It's live footage. And Rami Arav and I are leaning over and the whole group. And all of a sudden, Rami says, it's a fish. It's Jonah. And he hadn't even read this yet, but he immediately saw it's a fish and it's Jonah. And we were so excited. Now, we can't see the other side of the ossuary. Let me go back and show you again. See, there are two panels. Here's the Jonah image. And there is something on the other side. We can't see it. So we need to go back in and be able to examine these ossuaries in the future. And then this one is right up against it, very close, about like this. And we couldn't get the camera down in. But right here, guess what? There's an inscription. And the inscription goes with the idea of resurrection also. It's Greek dios, and then iaio, which is like a Greek spelling of Yahweh. So, O oh God, Yahweh, Upso is to lift up in Greek. Some of you know Greek. Upso is the verb to lift up. And then agba or hagba in Hebrew is to raise up. So, O oh God, Jehovah, raise up, raise up. Now, whether it's saying he will raise up or the imperative raise up, I mean, it's it's just scratched on there. But it's it's like a plea or a cry, I think. So what do we have in this tomb? You can see why we would call it the resurrection tomb or the Jonah tomb. If it's 200 feet away from the Jesus tomb, and it's got the only inscriptions about raising the dead of all of the 900 tombs and the 2,000 ossuaries that have been discovered, none of the others have anything like this. You can see our conclusion. People still disagree, that's fine. But you know, the reason people disagree is they have the idea that if you found the Jesus tomb with Jesus bones inside, that would mean no resurrection. And I have extensively written about this and explained that there are two tombs. One is temporary, one is permanent, but the resurrection of the dead has nothing to do with the dead body, the corpse, or the bones. Now, I know that doesn't fit with some ideas of Christian resurrection, but they developed later, and I can show you this. I'm going to put in the description a link to an article why people are confused about the earliest Christian views of resurrection, and I'm going to give you a view of resurrection of Jesus, whether you are a believer or not, or whether you believe it or not, a view 
that allows for the bones to be left behind. And it comes from the Apostle Paul, who talks about the body is old clothing that you take off. Then you have your soul that is naked and you get reclothed in a new body. It doesn't say you turn the old clothing into new clothing. You shed the old clothing. You're naked at death because you're out of the body. And then you're reclothed in the resurrection. And that is the view, I think. Later, you get the corpse walking around, first of all, in Matthew. Remember, Mark doesn't even have any appearances of Jesus. He thinks Jesus has ascended to heaven in a transfigured state. Read Mark chapter 9 if, if you want to get an idea of Mark's view of the resurrected Jesus. But in terms of the body, that comes in Matthew, particularly Luke, and in John, because you want to prove that it's really resurrection and not a ghost. So that is an apologetic kind of account. The earliest account for sure is the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Corinthians 9. He says, I've seen the Lord. And when you ask him, well, what kind of a body did you see? He says, well, it's indescribable. It's glorious and powerful and immortal. It's not the flesh and blood body. In fact, he says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. But in Luke's account, Jesus says, I'm flesh and bones, I'm not a ghost. Completely different idea. Read the article, I think you'll be convinced. This tomb does not negate resurrection faith. Now, whether somebody holds the resurrection faith or not, that's up to them. That's based on other things. But the idea of finding this tomb absolutely does not negate the original idea of resurrection faith. Okay, here's another ossuary, and I'm going to argue that this goes back into tomb five, okay? The Jesus tomb. Tomb six is the resurrection tomb. I think it goes back to tomb five. Now, where did this come from? This surfaced from a private collector in the year 2002 who bought it from an antiquities dealer. He gave various dates for when he might have gotten it. But it reads on the side right here, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. It's the James ossuary. Wow. Now, it was immediately attacked as maybe forged that brother of Jesus might, might have been added. And even if brother of Jesus was added, I don't think it was. You know, I think the evidence shows that original patina is in those letters. To find James, son of Joseph, if it's from the Talpio tomb, would be no different than finding Jesus, son of Joseph. You don't have to say brother of Jesus. But I think when James died, because his brother is so famous, they put brother of Jesus. And they're not going to put the Christ, the Lord, or something like that. It, it's a family burial. It's the name. This is Yaakov, son of Joseph. So let's take a look at it. Here it was on display in Toronto at the Royal Ontario Museum. This is me, if you recognize me, Herschel Shanks. This is Joe Fitzmeyer. This is Frank Moore Cross, Herschel Shanks, editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, who was part of bringing this to uh, Canada. And we're looking at the front of the ossuary and the inscription. These gentlemen have all three now passed away, but they were very, very fascinated with this. And I was very honored to stand even in their shadow on that day when I first saw the James ossuary. My colleague, Shimon Gibson, did a very nice archaeological drawing of the inscription that separates out these scratches so that you can see it. And it is very nicely done, and it reads very clearly, Yaakov bar Yosef, Achidu Yeshua, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And there is original patina in the word Yeshua. I do not think brother of Jesus was added. So... Where did it come from? This is new. This is new, what I'm giving you now. Where are we going to put the James Oshuary? James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, right here. Jesus, son of Joseph, right here from the Telpia Jesus tomb. Trapezoid shape, flat fitted lid, plain and simple. What happens when a family makes ossuaries, they often use the same ossuary dealer, the same stonemason. And also the idea 
of the elegance of simplicity and beauty, to have Jesus with his brother James side by side. Now, we know when James was killed in the Kidron Valley at the foot of the Mount of Olives, there was a memorial erected at the site of his death, and that's mentioned by pilgrims later, but that's not his tomb. That's in a flat valley where he died and was beaten to death, thrown off the top of the Temple Mount and beaten to death and stoned to death. But his body would have been taken then to a tomb. Now, this is weathered and this is not. And we have good evidence to think that this was removed from the Talpiot tomb at an earlier period. When exactly, I don't know for sure. I've got some good theories. But I think when the tomb was discovered in 1980, this was already out of the tomb. But that's for another video in the future, maybe. But notice this, brand new. This was during COVID. People have not even reacted to this yet. It's like nobody knows that it exists. I put it on my blog, but I'm not world famous enough for everybody to jump on this. There are new geochemical tests of the soil See, in a tomb, the soil soaks into the limestone. Limestone is very porous and soft, which means every tomb has its own soil signature. And in this study, there were test samples of many, many tombs in the Jerusalem area on the north, on the east, on the south, and so forth, as test cases, as control samples. And what you look at as the elements of the soil, the makeup of the soil. And guess what? Are you ready? The James ossuary soil that is seeped into the limestone deep inside matches the Taupio tomb in Jerusalem. Now, when I say matches, it correlates very closely with it. If you had a graph, and this article has the graphs, you can look. You know, have this tomb here, and this tomb here, and this tomb here, and this tomb here. And all of a sudden, you come to the Talpio Jesus family tomb, and the James ossuary is right in the circle of the other ossuaries that were found in the tomb. I think that puts the James ossuary, in antiquity at least, as part of the Jesus family tomb. So now we have Jesus, son of Joseph, Yose the brother, Maria, either a sister or maybe the mother, Mary, and possibly Mary Magdalene, Mary Omne, and a son of Jesus. So that's number six. Number seven, I got to hurry here, Alexandros, Simon of Cyrene. You can see Simon here, Alexandros is written on the lid. In November 1941, Eleazar Sukenik and Nachman Avigad, two very famous archaeologists in the Kidron Valley, excavated a tomb that had been uncovered, had a number of ossuaries, I won't discuss all of that, but one of them was Simon and his son, Alexandros, and it's the ossuary of Alexandros with Simon also in it, and it's Simon the Cyrenian, and look at this, Mark 15, verse 21, and they compelled one, Simon a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, so he's coming up into Jerusalem from the south, the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. So Alexander and Simon are in this ossuary, and Rufus probably had not deceased yet, so he's not in the tomb. And this cave burial goes out in 70. So these two probably died before 70, and they were known to Mark's readers, because he mentions them as if they would know who these are. Can I prove it, Simon, the Cyrenian who carried the cross of Jesus? Of course not. But I'm going to put it down as number seven, because it's very interesting. Number eight, the Abba tomb. The Abba tomb was found in October 1970, north of Jerusalem, Gavat Hamivtar. It has this wonderful inscription, Here's a color version of it, now in the Rockefeller Museum. I am Abba, son of Eleazar the priest. So this is a priestly tomb. I am Abba the oppressed, the persecuted, born in Jerusalem, exiled to Babylon, who brought back Matthiah, son of Judah, and buried him in the cave that I purchased. So Abba the priest is buried here. 
as well as Mattiah, or Matthew, son of Judah. And we think this is, in fact, the last Maccabean king. His name is Antigonus, and that's why it's such a big deal and such an elaborate tomb. And look at the two ossuaries, how beautifully they're decorated. And out of the Antigonus or Matthias ossuary is this fragment of the jawbone and his whole skeleton actually was uh, recovered as well as these nails you can see there are four of them that are crucifixion nails and they were put through the hands this is something new that we've learned so this person was crucified and there's also a cut through mark on his neck as if he might have been beheaded or at least hacked in the neck and so what do we know about Antigonus? If you don't know Antigonus, here he is right here. Here's the Hashmonean dynasty. You start with the father and the three sons, Simon, Judas, and Jonathan, right? And then you get King Alexander and his wife, Alexandra. The two priests that were rivals, remember? Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus. And one had a daughter and one had a son who married. And they are the parents of Miriam that Herod married. So why is Herod marrying a Hashmonean princess? Because his father is Idomean. He's a convert to Judaism. And his mother is Arabian. He has no pedigree. How can he be king of the Jews? He's not Davidic. He's not priestly. But by marrying Miriam, and he had two boys that he later killed because he started worrying that they are going to take over from him even while he's living, uh, he was trying to get a pedigree. He was trying to get a little bit of royalty. Well, Antigonus was Herod's enemy. In the final battle at Jerusalem, it was in the winter. It was snowing. Josephus tells the vivid story. He corners Antigonus in Jerusalem, 37 BC, and he captures Jerusalem and declares that he's now the conqueror of Jerusalem, and he's backed up by the emperor of Rome, Emperor Augustus, and he sends Antigonus to Mark Antony, who has him crucified and beheaded. So he was buried, and now Abba is bringing his remains to Jerusalem. He has a daughter, though, watch this, and she's unnamed. We don't know who she is, but Antipater, who's the son of Herod the Great, he's the oldest son, the firstborn, Herod originally wanted him to take over. Then he got jealous of him and killed him. But he did have Antipater marry another Hashmonean princess. So he kills the last Hashmonean prince, takes the daughter who's a princess, and marries her to his son. You see what he's doing? This is trying to spread your royalty through marriage so that the children could somehow be acceptable to the Jewish people. By the way, there's a published article on the Abba tomb, and you can read it, a new proposal uh, regarding Abba's identity that he is, in fact, Antigonus. I think it's very convincing. Here's some of the evidence. Here's the Abba tomb. Here's King Antigonus. So you can go down the list here and see the name. Uh, his name was Matai. His father was Judah, so he's son of Judah. That fits. His bones are brought to Jerusalem. He was a priest. Uh, he was exiled to Babylon uh, because he was an ally of the Parthian Empire and then was later killed. Uh, the bones show evidence of punishment, so he's an enemy of Rome. The Roman general Sosius called him Antigone, making fun of him because he said he looked like a woman. And when this was first found, when this ossuary was first found, the bones they thought were the ossuary of a woman because he was very slight in height than his bone structure like a female might be. But it turns out that King Antigonus was made fun of as being like a woman. They called him Antigone, as I said. So very, very interesting. Now, this is fiction, so don't get excited. King Jesus, Robert Graves, you remember I, Claudius, the PBS series and the famous novel? Robert Graves, great historian and fiction writer, kind of reminds me of Gore Vidal. He really knew his history, but he could write a mean novel. So he has a novel called King Jesus, and, which, and here's what he argues, that the daughter of Antigonus 
is in fact Mary, the mother of Jesus, and that she was married off to Herod's son so that Jesus would actually be the grandson of Herod the Great through his firstborn son. I mean, that's got to be pretty crazy, but you should read the book. It's a thrill to read. And that would make Jesus of the royal family of the Hashmoneans through his mother, Mary. Uh, I'll leave you with that. Now, we did DNA on the Abba tomb remains, and the tests were very interesting. Not only did we discover the crucifixion nails in the hands, and I'll explain that now, but number nine, that tomb, not the Abba tomb, but now we're on number nine, that, that had in it a crucified man. His name is Yonatan. It was found in 1968, also at Gavat Hamivtar, interesting enough. And there's a nail through the heel. Here's the actual bone. Look, a nail through the heel bone. I've seen this. The real thing, not the model. So now we know that this is how people were nailed up to a cross. Because if you put a nail through here, you would break all kinds of blood vessels and veins, and the person would bleed to death in a matter of minutes. And it wouldn't hold. But here you would have through the heel bone, the largest bone of the body, and it doesn't have blood vessels in it. So you could uh, support the weight of the person. There's also a little bench. Crucifixion was naked, by the way. That's why I like this uh, picture. It's more realistic. But this we now know is wrong. The nails were not put through the wrist. They were put through the hands, but not here. The hands were wrapped around the cross and the arms were tied so that the weight of the body supported by the elbows, you see that? And then these hands are pulled up and nailed like tacks, two nails put in each hand like this. It makes real sense. And now we have two tombs with crucifixion evidence. One is how they did the feet and the other one is how they did the hands. That would be these right here. Let me go back just to remind you these right here and you see the bone material still so we now know something about crucifixion that we didn't know before in terms of how it was done we need to take off his loincloth because part of the shame of crucifixion was the fact that he would be naked also bones broken to take him down from the cross very interesting you talk about archaeology in the time of jesus and finally, number 10, get ready, Cave 2001 sounds very surrealistic. Uh, most people are told that there were three skeletons found at Masada. If you know the story of Masada, last siege of the Jewish rebels, the 10th Roman legion has come down, set up camps. Many of you know the story, I won't repeat it. And everybody says, but where were the skeletons? Well, what wasn't initially known is at the very southern tip in this cave right here, which has two entrances, Cave 2000, Cave 2001, uh, were found 25 skeletons. Men, women, children, and they were definitely living in the cave. Two of the women were pregnant. These are Jewish defenders of Masada, but I don't think they were part of the suicide pack. They're a separate group that is hiding here the suicide pact Josephus tells us about involved almost a thousand people, 900 and something people. And yet there were six survivors. Now think about that. I'll get to that in a minute. It could be that this group doesn't go along with that. They're at the very southern tip and they're living in this cave and their skeletons were found in this cave. Now, you got to carbon date them because people inhabited Masada way after Masada up into the Christian Byzantine period and so forth. And that was done. The mats and the organic material in the cave dated to the first century. These are defenders of Masada. They are Jewish men, women, and children, including two unborn children, as I said. And it looks like they were just... Uh, hacked to pieces and killed by the Romans and their bodies were left there. But some of these skeletal remains have been studied. The bulk of them were buried at the foot of Masada in a public tomb at the end of this ramp that the Romans built to, 
take over Masada. You can't see it in this picture. Actually, you can. That's the tomb right there. You can barely see it right there. And they were given an honorary military funeral in the 1960s when they were discovered. But uh, samples of the bones were preserved and DNA has been done on one of the Masada skeletons, not this one, but some of the others from this cave, as well as the Abba skeleton. As I told you, we did DNA on the Abba skeleton. So here's the Abba skeleton fragment from that jawbone, which is a really good place to get a sample because it's inside the jaw. And guess what? According to Josephus, seven people survived Masada. And there was a woman, an older woman, and another woman who was a relative of Eleazar, who was the leader of the rebels at Masada, and he's definitely a priest, given his name. And this woman was related to him and superior in prudence and learning. She's a highborn woman with five children. I think these are children of Eleazar, meaning he's probably of the Maccabean lineage. We don't know for sure, but he's definitely priestly, I think. These five children would carry the priestly lineage as well. And they'd hidden in a cavern underground. And when the Romans came in, they found these surviving people. This is the royal family of the surviving Hashmoneans. Remember when I said Antigonus is the last Hashmonean king, it doesn't mean all the people of the Hashmonean lineage were wiped out. But I think we can say these are of the priestly royal family. Now notice this. We did DNA skeletal remains from the Abba tomb of our Antigonus guy, if that's who he is, and one of the Masada skeletons. And in the revised samples, look what we get in terms of a match. Look at that. Meaning these two are very closely related. In other words, Whoever is in the Abba tomb, and I think it is Antigonus, Matthew, son of Judah, we'd call him in English, and the ones at Masada that were sampled uh, are of the same priestly royal family. And I think that's amazing. And that would help us to then interpret why these people survived, because they were carrying the line of Eleazar the priest. Very, very interesting. So I think that's it. Nope, one more slide, just to remind you where everything is. Okay, here's Jerusalem. Uh, here is the Mount of Olives. Bethany's this way, and that Bethphage tomb would be there. Uh, the tomb of the Shroud is right here. The Talpiot tombs are down below. And let's see, we also looked at the Abba tomb, of course, would be up here north in Jerusalem as well as the uh, crucified man tomb would be up here in the north. Our unprovidence ossuary, we don't know where it came from. We got the Kidron Valley ossuaries. So you can see we've got a good sample of ossuaries. And I think there's some real relationship, maybe to the Jesus family itself. Let me stop the share. Because if those Talpiot tombs, the resurrection tomb, the Jonah tomb, and the Jesus family tomb with the James ossuary in it is the family tomb of Jesus, which I believe it is. I mean, I'm 99% sure. Now, here's what you're going to hear all the time. And I know this is getting long, but, you know, my videos are for people that are really interested in this stuff. And lots of my viewers say, long, are you kidding? I wanted you to go another hour, which I'm not going to do today, thankfully, for all of us, right? My voice is getting tired. But let me tell you something. Here's what you're going to hear. Scholars have looked at the Talpiot tomb, and no reputable scholar has concluded that it's likely the Jesus family tomb. And then if you say, well, what about Dr. James Tabor? Oh, yeah, Dr. Tabor. Yeah, I guess he's reputable. You know, I get kind of kicked to the curb there. Not everybody says that, but you hear that all the time. What you will hear is no real archaeologists believe it. Well, since I'm not a real archaeologist, I guess that could be true. But, you know, more people think it than you would think. It's kind of like, 
oh, I found Noah's Ark, or I found the Ark of the Covenant, you know, or I found uh, the burial shroud of Jesus, or something like that. Uh, well, I, Shimon and I did find a burial shroud. I don't think it's Jesus. But uh, as Bob Dylan said, I can't help it if I'm lucky in another context. Some of you will know that song, Idiot Wind, right? So uh, let me leave you with that and just say, you know, the evidence is there. And you can make your own decision. But we now have new evidence regarding the James Ossuary coming from the Tapio tomb. And statistically, as one of my friends says, who is a statistician, that's a slam dunk. You're getting way up there in terms of probability. What you've got to imagine with the Jesus family, and you'll get this in my article, a hypothesis article. I'll put all the links in the description. You can have all of this material. But you got to think of a stadium of, say, 50,000 people, men and women, okay? And then you ask all of the Marys to stand up. And you might even get up to, what, half of the women, a little less than half of the women named Mary. How many of you had a husband named Joseph? You'll still get quite a few because Joseph is a common name. Anybody have a son named Jesus? Jesus is only 4.5% of male names. And how many of 4.5% would happen to have Mary, maybe half, but also Joseph as the husband? You see how you're cutting it down. And then if you keep going, what about James, the brother of Jesus? Then it's over. You're telling people to sit down. Stand up if your name's Mary. Sit down if you didn't have a husband, Joseph. Sit down if you don't have a son named Jesus might have one or two left. Sit down if you don't have a son named James, son of Joseph. Everybody's down, unless Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, and she'd still be standing. I know that's simplistic, but then you add Yose, and then you add Mariamne, and we do know that Mariamne, in terms of her DNA, does not seem to be related to the Jesus DNA. So back in 2005, we did some preliminary DNA tests, and then we repeated them and we got some confusing results. So here's where we are now. I'm not trying to get you to join my Patreon, but if you do join my Patreon, everybody gets the same benefits. And what we're studying together as a group, people that are really interested in this, is the latest developments on the DNA front. That's what we've been doing now for several months. And we are now going to commission new DNA tests. And they are going to be the new generation sequencing where you get unbelievable readings from the smallest amount of even ancient DNA. So people are always asking me, like, well, why don't you test all the ossuaries? And why don't you see this? And why, why don't you do that? Well, we don't have bones from all of them. They've been emptied and kind of brushed out. But now we think that we can get good DNA results from the residue that's left in the ossuary. So stay tuned, folks. Jesus Archaeology, first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care. We'll go somewhere else next time. I think we're going to go to Sepphoris, the urban capital of the Galilee. See you later. <music>